You know what I'm doing here? I'm I'm typing to the people who are on here, uh, already on watching me, and uh, the numbers are climbing. I just typed, hey, everyone, please like and share. Thank you so much for joining me today here on these social media platforms for this week's installment of Transcendent. Transcendent is our weekly Facebook uh, live broadcast over several different uh, media platforms uh, from SABWB design, designed to really inform, instruct, enlighten, and even incite uh, us to collective God-centered action that does what CBC, uh, uh, CBC, what uh, SABWB is designed to do. What is SABWB and what is it designed to do? It is the number one place where influencers from every race, position, and perspective come together for two main purposes. One is to build trusting relationships, and two is to collaborate or to work <clears throat> on, the, uh, on the value and the implementation of principles that shape the culture. Ultimately, our desire is to shape the culture. You're going to hear the, that phrase associated with SABWB as we move on <clears throat> toward this fulfillment of this mission that God has given this ministry, of which you are a part. Uh, SABWB needs your partnership. Uh, you can become a partner. Uh, I'm so thankful. Uh, I'll say this in the midst of uh, inviting your partnership. I'm so thankful for those of you who just yesterday uh, joined us at the uh, Focus Center Bookstore and Cafe on the grounds of Faith Outreach Center International at 3806 Sunshine Ranch Road. And there you heard uh, the present president of the San Antonio Police Officers Association, Danny Diaz, give us really the, the, the truth and information concerning Fix SA and namely Fix SAPD. Uh, it is I'll say something about that later, but it was refreshing to hear the truth and hear uh, President Diaz's heart about him desiring to work with all facets of the community rather than allow our community of San Antonio to be shaped and managed to, for, to allow the culture really to be shaped by those who are not Nat not, not only native, but citizens of San Antonio, really an agenda that is coming down from a national basis, coming into the city of San Antonio, and our city council is complicit with these forces coming into our city and shaping our city, in many cases, away from the desire of the population, but in agreement with what the national agenda might be. And you and I have to be courageous enough we have to be fed up enough tonight tonight's title the winter of our discontent with its subtitle why we can't wait speaks to the very issues that we have been uh looking at here in the city of san antonio which many cities around around the country are looking at because those cities have been strategically targeted to push a national agenda and to move the nation away from its glorious foundings the principles that is of its glorious foundings, those principles were not always uh, followed, uh, you know, to to a great degree. But they were they always provided an anchor point back to which the nation could return. And we have this same uh, premise and this same operation in Scripture concerning the nation of Israel and the principles of God. God often required that the nation turn back to the principles that, that he had established it upon, and then they would be what the Hebrew calls a segula. They would be a, pre, a, uh, a peculiar, a special people uh, that God would bless to the degree that his blessing upon them would provoke the attention and the desire of other nations to also become the children of God and thus fill the, knowledge, fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. But, like Israel of old, the nation now has within it 
agencies that desire not to turn the nation back toward its glorious founding principles, but to lead it away from those principles and into an abyss of confusion and into abyss of, uh, uh, of defeat and despair for the many and a place of prized elitism for the few as they use the masses to as a labor force and desire for themselves all the goods of life while promising or oppressing, either promising what they don't deliver on or oppressing when there seems to be a voice of dissent rising. But we are in, no, we are in the winter of our discontent. And so uh, your, your partnership with SABWB helps greatly to do that. Your partnership is required for us to continue to man the station 24-7. Uh, churches will address things like this. Pastors will preach, some of them at least, some pastors will preach on matters like this from their pulpit in terms of justice, biblical justice, not social justice that is measured out in the in the uneven balances of men's estimations. <clears throat> Those balances always, the uneven balances of men's estimations, people's estimations, always favors a group and disfavors other groups. But when we go back to the objective truth of God's word, that word stands unclouded and uncompromised in the midst of whatever is going on around us and provides us with a safe haven that we as a people of the United States can return to and begin to, to live out the premises of those principles, live out the statements made in those principles uh, and, and cause our lives as people and as a nation to elevate again to that place that is defined biblically as special or secular or peculiar so to the point that other nations of the earth would also desire the same God that we serve and desire the same lifestyle that we have accrued as a result of our uh, our uh, willing willing humility in serving the living God. SABWB is designed to help that happen right here in the city of San Antonio, Texas. You can become our partners right now. Uh, and there are some benefits of partnership. I'll t tell you about those as we as we go on. We're going to have a couple of commercials today. Uh, and at the end of those commercials, I'll come back and speak to you about what some of those benefits uh, uh, are that you accrue as a member of. Uh, as a supporter and a partner of uh, San Antonio in black, white, and brown. You remember that we were birthed again in the crucible of conflict uh, when another ordinance of our city that was not written by anyone in our city, it was written by the Human Rights C uh, Commission headquartered in Washington, D.C., and its agenda, the agenda of the Human Rights Commission is to... Uh, to fashion the laws in major metropolitan areas in the country and when uh, in a certain direction and when those laws are fashioned that way in those major metropolitan centers then the nation collectively is also changed it didn't start in other words our mayor our then mayor julian castro did not sit down one day and say uh, uh, our citizens are undergoing uh, a certain uh, sexual orientation among our citizens is, go is being punished. So let us write an ordinance that, uh, 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 that makes sure that they're treated fairly and equally. Uh, and, and then let's push this uh, through the city of San Antonio. No, that was not the then Mayor Julian Castro's idea. We can see that the, the, the Castro brothers have some really outlandish ideas. Joaquin Castro, his twin brother, was also a part of the house managers that did an impeachment on a president that was no longer in office. And, and, and uh, that president was exonerated a second time. So he's 2-0 and o where impeachment processes are, are concerned. And, and his voice and his influence is still a part of this winter of our discontent that I will tell you about in a moment. I have a book in my hand um, uh, that, is, that was written by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, that bears the subtitle of our, t our talk for tonight, the, the, Why We Can't Wait. I can't wait to get into some of this material with you, but so I want to go ahead and 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 get through our partnership piece and just ask you to to our number eight four three two one to this number eight four three two one text the message uh, the number ten a space 
and then S-A-B-W-B. If someone will put that in remarks as you normally do when I come on, I appreciate that. I see that a number of you are on tonight. Maddie, thanks for, for hitting the lines for us. That's great. Jonathan, uh, it starts to become a dictatorship over people. Yes, indeed it does. And it will, uh, Jonathan, it will remain a dictatorship until people have decided that they're no longer going to take it. And my purpose here tonight is to find the, the hundreds of thousands of people right here in the city of San Antonio who have lived through the winter of this discontent and are, and are, uh, are making a decision that collectively we're not going to do it anymore. It, even as early as tomorrow when the mask comes off in Texas by uh, the governor's uh, edict that masks are no longer uh, mandatory. Uh, we'll see that the battle is already ensuing between who's going to who's going to have influence or who's going to in, infringe on the freedoms and the liberties of the people most. Will it be government or will it be business? And there will be business who will uh, because they are not politically aligned with the governor's office. There'll be businesses who will say, well, uh, although the governor says you don't have to wear a mask in my establishment, you must wear it. And those of us who are free citizens, who are not insensitive to people, uh, 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 it amazes me how that because some people think that you don't consider the matter the way they consider it. Now they have a right to judge what may be uh, what they consider to be the motive of your heart for not doing it. Someone will say, if you don't if you don't wear a mask, then you don't care about anybody else's well-being. Well, you assume that wearing a mask is actually the silver bullet that that is the solve for this problem and it's obvious to you that even the growing numbers although inflated although vastly inflated if those growing numbers were true they would prove themselves that the mask is not the silver bullet that is being promoted to be and then there is an equal uh, if not greater bank of information and knowledge from medical professionals that tell you the moment you touch that mask and the moment you touch something else or other people and you don't have any gloves on, then you have already violated the point and already have exposed people to, to the, the same danger that you pretend to relieve them from. However, I do understand that the wearing of masks is a psychological aid to many of us, and, and we we'll wear them because we think we're doing somebody a service. Wonderful. But don't criticize a person whose view is different from your own based on scientific information and based on uh, knowledge that is is equal to anything actually more sound than anything dr fauci for example has gone from one end of the spectrum to the next about the necessity for masks for not needing to wear masks and now needing to wear two or three or four and have all kinds of stuff happen when you listen when you move away from the positions of liberty and give people an opportunity to make the decisions about their own health and believe that people don't want to make other people sick that if they're feeling sick or if they're having uh, sick symptoms. They're going to stay at home. They're going to socially distance themselves. They're going to keep their hands washed, with they ought, which they ought to be uh, doing anyway. And they're going to take some prophylactics. I'll talk about that in a minute. Prophylactics are things that you take in order to prevent the onset of a disease. And now the whole vaxxed world, the, va the world of vaccinations, that pressure is also now placed on the population to either you get vaccinated. If you don't get vaccinated, you don't care. Who told you that? It, and you then if you take that position, you then assume that everything you think about and what you think is what you have been told. Everything that you think about this situation is as has been reported and everyone else is on this subject is obviously wrong and you're obviously 100 percent right. How narrow minded is that? How myopic is that view? We have to make the decision that we are going to be a people who can last through the winter of our discontent and then move on into uh, the greater expressions of liberty, which we are no longer willing to sit by and watch be played with in the halls of government or within the, uh, the, uh, the boardrooms of businesses. We're no longer going to allow our freedoms to be dangled uh, in front of us as a carrot that one day we may attain to them. But there is a winter of discontent. There is a series of things that has happened over the winter of 2020, and we're still in the winter of 2020 for the next couple of weeks. And, and this winter of discontent will break open 
into a glorious spring of the revival of liberty and the revival of freedoms and courage in the heart of people that we're not pulled and tugged so much by what uh, is said in the media. And when the media is slanted, it becomes a very dangerous tool. Either way, slanted in either direction. You and I have to be people who are, are, are seeking objective ground and compassionate ground. When we're allowed to be objective and compassionate, Oh my goodness, I just, my heart so filled with you. My heart is so filled with the issues of the day. I need you to like and share this broadcast. That has something to do with the algorithms that uh, allow even the, the 5,000 plus people that are on my contact list and on my Facebook uh, uh, fan page and whatnot to be able to see and to be able to participate and listen. It's because people like you will like and share it. Thank you for being on here today. I see that we have a number of you that are, uh, and I'm so glad that you are. Uh, go ahead and like, control and distraction type. Yes, yes, Jonathan, you're on it tonight. Uh, Steve and Mark and, and uh, Maddie and Melba uh, and all of the rest of you, uh, go ahead and, and like and share uh, this broadcast so that other people can get a hold of it. Okay, so, uh, and become our partner just by going to 84321, doing the number 10, uh, texting the number 10 and a space S-A-B-W-B and you will become our monthly partner and there's some benefits to that as I said I'll get to that in a moment but I want to get to our topic for tonight our topic for tonight is the winter of our discontent now uh, in order for me to to uh, I guess rightfully express that I have to take you to a meeting that happened just yesterday on the grounds of Faith Outreach Center and our Focus Center Bookstore and Cafe, we had two presenters. Uh, the first uh, presenter was Danny Adias. As I said, he is the current president of the San Antonio Police Officers Association. And he's making his rounds in the community. You will no doubt see Danny uh, on this broadcast before the month uh, of March and April is out. It was, you'll probably see him a couple of times. Uh, San Antonio in black, white, and brown. Uh, we just opened our offices last Friday. Uh, they now have, we now have a place that we can concentrate activity in 24, uh, well, I would say 24 hours a day, but every day of the week, we can be working on things that are uh, designed to make sure that our liberties are not stolen and that Proverbs 29, 2 when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked bear rule, people mourn. That, that, that right people are set in office politically and that these other spheres of influence in our community, business and sports and entertainment and in the area of education, all of those are coordinating around the same principles and that we're working toward the, the advancement, namely of the kingdom of God and the principles of the kingdom, but also as they are manifested, as the principles of the kingdom of God are manifested, liberty and opportunity and freedom, all of those things will be the, the makeup of our culture and our society. And everybody, everybody prospers in the midst of that. Everybody who has a desire for liberty and everybody who has a desire for freedom and for his brother or sister to be free, they prosper where those principles are enforced. But we are now uh, arranged over the city of San Antonio even. is not that attitude of expressing liberty and freedom. Now it's about controlling the masses. There's, there is a uh, undeniable links let me just say it put it that way there's undeniable links between city hall and uh and the business community major businesses uh, uh th there are undeniable links between officials in, in at city hall and officials in the business community so that those two uh factions work together and as you uh as you'll see tonight when when there are pillars in a culture that work together to oppress people, it becomes necessary that the people who are, who are uh, targeted to be oppressed, that those people rise up in the power and the strength of God and in the sense of, 
uh, camaraderie with each other. That's why SABWB exists to provide us a point of action, a point of location where we can come together and do that. And then we, the people, we, the people, you see, this is the, this, when I mentioned to you earlier, the principles, uh, the glorious principles of our founding, we find them in the pre, uh, in the preamble to the constitution. We, the people of the United States in order to perform, in, in order to form a more perfect union, uh, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. We do ordain and establish this constitution of the United States of America. Establish justice is the second of that phrase. A step, form a more perfect union, establish justice. And then it says, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. We, the people, have that responsibility not our governing authorities. The governing authorities are put in place by we, the people, and they are there to represent the, uh, the majority or the, or it's not mob rule. They're there to represent the principles that the people have aligned with and have agreed to live under. Our representative or a representative form of government are called a republic that means that we have a set of principles that we operate by and people vote to put people into office that will abide by those set of principles. And then as they do, the environment is shaped for success and for liberty and for prosperity and freedom and for joy. But when we don't participate in that process of putting right leaders into place, then wrong leaders get into place and they start to maneuver among the pillars of business and politics and education and so forth. And they, they begin to maneuver a plan that oppresses the masses and gives rise to the elite few. Now you can, you and I can make that happen, but not listen. I know this is in your heart too. Not on my watch. I hear you saying, not on my watch. I, I see you, Rosemary. I see you, Liz. Thanks for coming on. Guys, please go ahead and like and share this because that's the only way the algorithm is going to respond is that if you like it and share it and push it out and get it out where other people can see and hear it and be a part of it. Okay, so let's talk now about the winter of our discontent. Uh, the reason I, I brought that meeting up yesterday is to tell you about... Uh, a very, very highly educated and erudite and scholarly woman uh, here in the state of Texas. In fact, she is the foremost expert in the state of Texas on voter integrity or also the, um, the one who, based on her, her intelligence, her knowledge, her skill, her expertise, and her experience uh, in the technological field, uh, engineering, is, was able to, because she ran for office uh, in Austin, and she was able to go back based upon some of the dynamics that she experienced in her race, was able to go back and look at some of the data and scour the data to see if, in fact, she lost by popular vote to a, to a person who had come in with two weeks left in the race and was an avowed atheist in the midst of... Uh, a voting block that contained, I think she told she told the audience yesterday, 50 churches, and one on every every three blocks was that there was a church, and with active voters in them who would not have voted to put an atheist into office. So just the, looking at the shape of the dynamics in her culture, uh, she began to take her knowledge and go look at the records and see actually what happened. And much to not much to her surprise, but uh, her data revealed what her suspicions were is that this had been a robbery. This had been a technological robbery in Texas, in the city of Austin. I think it was a, a community north of Austin uh, that had exercised these uh, tools to manipulate the will of the people expressed through their vote it bent and twisted the will of their people to into the framework that they wanted in order to push the individual that they wanted there. She's laid these cases out. Her evidence is irrefutable. And yet, while the evidence 
was irrefutable to lower courts. The court in Austin and the third court of appeals both said that she, that she, because she sued them, said her lawsuit was frivolous. But it went on to the Supreme Court, and not only they said her, her, her lawsuits were frivolous, but they fined her for bringing them out, making, seeking to make an example out of her, proving that no one is able to stand up against the system. The, the reason I'm telling you about it, the reason I'm telling you about it, and the reason I ask her to come is because we're in the midst of our own elections here in the city of San Antonio. And no matter who your person is that you want to vote for, if the voting process, if the counting process is manipulated, then all of the promises and all of the work and all of the effort made becomes a moot point because in the end, it can be made to look like the, the uh, voting architects want it to look, the powers that be. And many in many cases, those powers, for, for example, in, in uh, the winter of our discontent, the winter, the winter of 2020, uh, it was not even people in the United States that tabulated the votes of the citizens in the United States. And in an investigation took us outside into uh, to Italy and to Germany where these machines were tabulating votes for American citizens. Yes. And now we're right here in our own elections here in the city of San Antonio and we must ensure uh, that that he hello, uh, Liz, thanks for coming on again. Guys, please like and share, like and share, like and share, because that will help us uh, uh, get the message out tonight and get it to people who need to hear it. Even in this, see, the algorithms are so written to suppress voices. There are 5,000 people, uh, both on my fan page and on my personal Facebook page, and yet the things that I'm putting out that my friends... Uh, should be able to see algorithms lock them out from seeing it because mathematics can constrict as it has been doing. It, it can become like a boa constrictor to your voice. And if we don't do the things that break that algorithmic uh, pattern, then there are very few people that will be able to hear even on what is called social media. Uh, your voice can be very limited because of mathematic algorithms. But you and I can break that by doing the like share process. So if you're in a, on your social media uh, sphere, do it tonight. Uh, like and share this on your own social media free feeds. I see Maddie was bit busy doing that earlier. Um, and, and I thank you for doing it. I thank you for doing it. Uh, so because she brought this forth, they, they fined her, the lower court fined her $100,000, making an example of out of her so that no one would dare challenge uh, this infrastructure, this crooked, corrupt infrastructure that they have in place. Well, she and thankfully her husband uh, appealed that court's decision to the Third uh, Circuit Court of Appeals. And, and laid the evidence out before them as well. And like the lower court, the Third Circuit Court also said, this is frivolous. They knew it wasn't frivolous. She had the mathematical data in front of her. She had all of the records, all of the, the off time stamps, all of the unequal uh, downloads of the voting uh, sections in her area. All of it laid out. And yet the, the lower court and the third, courts, uh, third Circuit Court of Appeals said to her it was frivolous. She went on to the Texas State Supreme Court. Thankfully, there was enough sense in the judges at the Texas uh, State Supreme Court to side with her and remove those fees and fines totaling $145,000 that they levied upon her to shut her mouth up but Dr. Laura Presley and her husband pressed through and we are glad and indebted to them uh, for doing so because in so doing, she has exposed the, the soft underbelly, the corruption side of the voting process. So I want to say all of that to say to you that it was evident to the scores of people that, was in, that were in the room yesterday.
that is, it is clearly evident that by the numbers, we are dealing with corruption in the voting process. And we're about to have an election on the 1st of May. So San Antonio and black, white and brown, again, will be that central hub that makes sure that our people are both trained and placed not in just the poll watchers in the places where the votes take place, but where the actual count is taking place. This was the strategy that Dr. Presley released to us yesterday in stating this. She said she quoted Stalin, who, by the way, is a bloody uh, communist dictator. Uh, out of Russia, but he is here's what here's what Stalin said. Stalin said, I don't care how many people vote, I don't care who votes and how many times they vote. What I care about is who counts the votes and how they're counted. Now he knew that really what decides finally what happens is the how the who who's counting the votes and how they're counted. Well now that we know that from Dr. Presley's uh knowledge and experience we're training people and we'll be training people to make sure that in the places where the votes are being being counted, that the trail of, of uh, custody from the t from the voting booth all the way into the counting places is done. And at the counting places, there's no corruption either. Now, she said, uh, Dr. Presley said, there is a way even to cheat after that. It's just you have it's harder for you. Let's not make it easy on a system to rob us of our freedom and our liberty to vote and, and to do that in a fraud free election on May 1st. Now, I wouldn't even be talking to you about the potential and, and not, not only the potential, but the actual actuality of uh, fraudulent practices in the voting system. If we had not gone through what we went through in December uh, of 2020, the winter of our discontent. I want to, I want to lead you up and I'm going to parallel, I'm going to parallel the winter of our discontent, uh, with the subtitle, why we can't wait. If you are familiar with the civil rights movement, uh, Dr. King, Dr. Ralph Abernathy, E.D. Nixon and others, then you are also familiar with the, some parallels in the language that I'm drawing. I have Dr. King's library. Uh, he's 39 years old when he was assassinated uh, this month uh, at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, and I've been reading through his material again, uh, particularly in the month of February, Black History Month. It's always good to refresh our understanding and renew our knowledge and, a, and we're thereby able to correlate because there is nothing new under the sun, the Proverbs tells us. We're able to correlate the activity that has taken place historically with what is taking place now and parallel some of the same dynamics that twisted and perverted things then are in place now. And the, the advantage of history like Dr. King's history is we also get to see what is available in terms of principles and uh, the spirit of unity and cooperation that breaks the hold of tyranny off that broke it off in the past and what can break it off right here in the 21st century and here in the city of San Antonio, namely with San Antonio black, white and black, white and brown. And you, you are SABWB and SABWB are you <laughs> to provide us with this opportunity to join our forces together and see fundamental change take place based on principles and not being snagged by the popular emotional tug of the day, whether that is Dr. Seuss's books or, or whether that is a, a racism issue or whether that is a sex and genderism issue. We're going to be looking at all of that tonight. And therefore, I want to take you into these parallels. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to show you uh, in just a moment. I'm going to show you a video of a young man uh, who expresses the anxiety that was that was uh, that encased even entombed the souls of black Americans during the civil rights movement. Uh, remember that the civil rights movement uh, took place because at the end of 244 years of brutal slavery, the same year that slavery 
uh, was ended in terms of an institutional uh, structure in, in America. The, the Emancipation Proclamation was written in December of 1862, but uh, declared or proclaimed uh, January 1, 1863. That was in the middle of a four-year civil war, which began in 1861. Well, when the Emancipation Proclamation was written, certainly it gave Africans, uh, African slaves a, an incentive for the war to end in favor of the North. Because if the war ended in favor of the North, then slavery would no longer be allowed in the United States. And all those imprisoned by slavery and brutalized by its impact and effect would be free. So there was an emphasis on joining up with the Union soldiers and breaking the back of slavery and relieving their backs from the stinging slave master's whip and to feel the fresh air of freedom blowing and liberty blowing in their faces again. As the same year rolled around the end of the Civil War and slavery has ended, in the same year and on the same month, there was enacted another group of laws called the Black Codes. They were called the Black Codes because they were written for the control, the manipulation and oppression of black people. They, there has been no other there's been no other codes written into the legal system in this country that are written specifically to oppress a racial group of people referred to by name. In 1865, there was, and they were called the Black Codes. They later became known as Jim Crow Laws. From 1865 to 1965, another 100 years, Slavery had moved from the brutalizing on the plantation into the institutions of government. And at the local level, those Jim Crow laws, listen to me real good right here, because although I've said it before, it bears repeating so that you can internalize and understand. Those Jim Crow laws at the local level was carried out by guess who? The police, those Jim Crow laws that said you couldn't sit at a counter uh, because you were black, you couldn't eat in a dining room because you were, you had to go around to the kitchen. Those, those same laws said you couldn't walk on the same side of the street as a white person. The same law that said you couldn't look one in the face. Those same laws were instruments of oppression that, that were given birth the same year that slavery as an institution ended. It didn't really end. It just morphed into a legal process that brought. I've been going for 40 minutes. Okay. Morphed into a legal process that brought uh, oppression to black people. Now, I want, to, I want you to listen to this black guy. I want you to listen to this video. And I want you to look at his face. And I want you to hear the angst, the frustration in his voice. And I want you to hear what he says. He's a young black man. And he's trying to deal with the oppression that has characterized the lifestyles of his grandparents and his parents. And yet he is yearning for something different. After he speaks to us a few minutes here, I want to come back to you. Hang with me and like and share, folks. Like and share. Uh, but listen to this, and I'll be right back. First you tell us that it is manly to keep your word. All right? If you are a man, you keep your word. And now all of the black people in this country are demanding, and even the black people in the whole world are demanding, is that you keep your word. You told us we were free. Well, then show us that we're free. You told us that there is justice, equality for all in this country. Well, then stick to your word and let us see the justice and equality for all. Or else admit to us that you're not a man, you're a worm, you're afraid of us, you're afraid to give us equal stand. You're afraid that if you give us equal ground that we will match you and we will override you. And if that's what you're afraid of us, then, then tell us that that's what you're afraid of. 
But don't keep hiding it from us and, and holding this up to us. And every time we ask you for something, you give us a little bit of something. And it's all tokenism. We don't want tokenism. And there are most black men in this world that don't want charity. And yet still every time we ask you for something, you give us a little piece, a little piece. You're playing games with us. We're not children. We're, we're big men. I've seen my father have to put up with all kinds of stuff. He was a big man. He raised a family. He went down south. And he had to go around to the back door with his wife. We're not asking for anything. We're not asking for any favors. All we want is what's ours. Now, there are many black veterans who are coming back and they're mad. They're angry. Do you think that they're going to sit down through this? Our fathers didn't have the knowledge that we had. They sat through it. But there are other black youth that are not going to sit through it. We know about Che. We know about uh, Fannin. We've read the books of our revolution. We've listened to Mal and his quotations. We know where we stand. We're not going to sit for it. We're asking, and if we ask and we don't get, we're prepared to stand up and take it. If I ask a man, I tell a man I am hungry. I tell him I am cold. And I ask him to do something about my condition. And this man holds a loaf of bread right in front of me so I can see it. And I keep asking him, I'm begging him to please give me a slice of the loaf of bread. I am hungry. Then it is known by every psychologist that the next step in the progression is I am going to knock him upside the head and take the bread from him. I'm not going to starve to death. All we're asking no one wants to see blood. No one likes the smell of blood. No one wants war. Anyone who's been in war doesn't want war. Everyone knows what it is to see the inside of a man's gut hanging out and see your friends die, see relatives die. No one wants to regress back to the state of mind where you have to think it's all for the cause. Therefore, my mother has to die. My wife has to die. My brothers and sisters have to die. No one wants that. But you're pushing us to it. You're leaving us no choice. We're asking, we're begging. The students up at Columbia, they ask. The brothers down south ask. The brothers in Latin America, the brothers in Africa, they're all asking. All they're doing is asking. Our fathers asked. Our grandfathers asked. The presidents of our universities, our colleges, had to go to your back doors to beg that their children be given just enough money so that they could be taught something to live off. And, and yet still, they ask and ask and ask and you refuse to give them anything. Now, we're, all, we're just about out of patience. We're not going to ask anymore. The news media says that it's only the young that are militant, only the young that want this and want that. Okay, but we're 40% of the black population now. Or we were a year ago and still yet we're climbing. Before long we'll be 50%, 55% and then we'll have the command. We're not going to take it. We're not going to take sitting in, in rotten parks and in and, and, and places that just aren't fit for living. We're not going to take it. There's a limit to a man's patience. And everyone knows that God, Christ, heaven, everyone knows that what we're asking is not a million dollars. What we're asking for is humanity. We're asking to be allowed to live like human beings. And God, you tell us that this is too much to ask. You're sick. You're definitely sick. How can you tell me that it's too much to ask to be a human being? I played that piece. In order for you to capture something about the level of discontent that injustice gives birth to in, in a person or in a people. In this particular case, it was the oppression of the 244 years of slavery and another 100 years of Jim Crow. Imagine that, three and a half centuries of being maligned and repre repressed and oppressed, held back, brutalized, that it, it began to boil over. Now, thankfully, God sent a man in the person of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
right into the belly of the South, where it was sweltering under the heat of racism in Montgomery, Alabama. And they began the process uh, through the Montgomery Improvement Association to begin to push back in a nonviolent act of Christian love. Now, this is what he entitles it. This is how Dr. King put language to what he was doing. Is this this nonviolent expression of Christian love? It later became known by one of the women uh, in the community, Juliet was her name, as, and she she put the the notions of Gandhi on it. Dr. King had had already studied uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi's movement in India, how he broke through the the class the classism that really segregated the people of India. And I use the word segregation intentionally because there is the same spirit of segregation that sought to divide people into classes in India and people into races in America and people into socioeconomic classes in this country. To, to, uh, the, the new segregationalists will use things like racism and they will use things like uh, lies and distortions to try to cause us to move in a direction against one another. And I encourage you not to let that happen. Here in the city of San Antonio, SABWB is your spot. We're going to have a grand opening to our offices. They're open and operational now, but we're going to put on the books a day, uh, and it will probably be after the normal work day, where where people can uh, have a, we'll have a procession. We'll meet in the parking lot of the building, and we'll process up to our offices and open the offices and give you a chance to see that there is an operational place in the city of San Antonio open every day of the week, pressing toward the resolve of these issues that, that relieve the oppression off of the shoulders. In this, in this young man's case, and in the case of our nation at that time, it was a matter of racism. And because we still feel the, the oppression, the race card is always brought back up by those who want to stoke the negative emotion and then manipulate the masses based on that negative emotion. But you and I have to do as Dr. Dr. King said, we have to enter into an intelligent quest, an intelligent quest to shape our culture in a godly fashion. And we're going to do it. Now, the, the next video that I want to show you uh, actually deals with how our modern day segregationalists, I'm actually going to write an op-ed. Uh, an op-ed is a uh, uh, an opinion editorial and publish it. I'm going to publish it uh, in the paper. I'm going to publish it uh, in social media. Uh, and I'm going to ask others to do so as well. Whoever saturates the culture gets to influence it or guide it. And if we don't saturate the culture with this message of truth through things like op-eds, plays, dramas, uh, Stuff done on the sidewalk, stuff done in public parks with youth dramatizing it. If we don't get the message out there and saturate the community with this knowledge, then the forces that be that have the powers of media will shut us down like algorithms shut this down and will shut us down and cause our voices to be diminished so that they will have the ears of the masses and through that can lead the masses literally into their own destruction, whistling Dixie as they go. But you and I have to get beyond that. Uh, in this next video piece, uh, our former President Obama uh, makes a statement, an exception is taken to that statement by uh, my friend, uh, Reverend Samuel Rodriguez. I want you to listen to what President Obama said, former President Obama, and I want you to listen to uh, the response 
that Samuel Rodriguez, Reverend Samuel Rodriguez gives. Uh, and I want you to note his demeanor. I want you to note uh, Sam Rodriguez's demeanor and his words. I want you to note the clarity of his words and I want you to note the disposition of his character in doing so. Watch this. There are a lot of evangelical Hispanics who, you know, the fact that Trump says racist things about Mexicans or puts uh, detainees, uh, you know, uh, uh, undocumented workers in cages, they think that's less important than the fact that, you know, he uh, supports their views on you know, gay marriage or abortion. Joining me now is Pastor Samuel Rodriguez. He's the author of From Survive to Thrive, as well as the president of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference. Pastor Samuel Rodriguez, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Now, I first want to talk about comments that former President Barack Obama made. There's a lot of evangelical Hispanics who, you know, the fact that Trump says racist things about Mexicans or puts uh, detainees, uh, you know, uh, uh, undocumented workers in cages, they think that's less important than the fact that, you know, he uh, supports their views on, you know, gay marriage or abortion. What do you make of the, the former president's comment? Wow. Here's my, here's my response. Wow. Just wow. I'm truly disappointed. I really am. Um, I don't celebrate President Obama's remarks. I admire President Obama as the first person of color to occupy Pennsylvania Avenue. He served as an inspiration for people of color across America, that there is no lid. You could actually thrive and reach the highest pinnacle of success or, or, or of influence for the purpose of advancing the greater good. But boy, am I truly disappointed. The word disappointment is an understatement. I push back on absolutely everything President Obama stated. It is factually incorrect, by the way. It's not just anecdotally incorrect. It is factually incorrect. I should know. We have the exit polling to prove it. There is not one survey, not one, one indication whatsoever anywhere in this known universe where Latinos shifted in advancing a life, religious liberty, biblical justice agenda because of gay marriage. Not one. President Obama seems to be stuck in the year 2001, 2008, 2010. Uh, stuck. So he's factually incorrect. About life, you know, he's correct there. Why did Latinos shift towards a more conservative agenda this year? Because we are the most pro-life community in America. We do believe in the sanctity of life. Yeah, we do. We believe every life is sacred and we're not ashamed of it. How about that? Uh, and yeah, the Democratic Party believes in partial birth abortion and late term abortion and even post birth abortion, according to the governor of Virginia. It's not our fault, President Obama, that your party is the party of socialism, late term abortion and secular totalitarianism infringing upon my God given right to worship. So, dear Mr. President, who I admire, who I really do admire, and I would even say as a pastor, I love. I'm disappointed. Why are you targeting brown people? Why are you targeting Latinos? I mean, isn't that what we're against? Aren't we supposed to come against any sort of rhetorical pornography that exacerbates div division and discord? So now you're attacking the Latino community? I'm very disappointed, Mr. President, very disappointed. And by the way, when the current occupant of Pennsylvania Avenue has made tweets or comments that I have found equally offensive, I, let, let's, let's just say it's on the record. Uh, I think that uh, that uh, Reverend Samuel Rodriguez answered him or answered uh, the statement that he made with both the right clarity, right level of clarity and truth, and with the right demeanor. Now, someone will say, it used to be that when a president or anyone in front of the media, when the media was pure, when the media was actually the protected entity that it is in the Constitution. The media is that, that instrument in our society that is to go after the truth. It is, to, it is to, to press for the exposure of the truth no matter who they're in front of. That the media cannot kowtow 
to a personality or to a structure. But when media is in bed with criminals, when media is in bed with liars, they will let liars like the lie President, uh, former President Obama just told go unchecked. Because if you will look for yourself, he sat there and said that that uh, former President Donald Trump talked, made racial slurs about Mexicans. He did not. What he said was that when people are coming through the border and I'll get I'll show you a border piece in just a minute that actually verifies what he said that when people are coming through the borders, that we're not getting Mexi Mexicans best, that there are rapists and murderers and others that are taking an opportunity of these soft borders to penetrate our country and do damage to our own citizens. Now, the media made him look like a monster for saying that. And President Obama knows that it's not true, and yet he sit very suavely on set told that lie and the media did not call him to carpet on it because the media is complicit with it. And then he went on to state a second lie about children in cages. If you, if you've seen the pictures taken of children in cages, if you go look at the timestamp on those pictures, you will see that those pictures were actually taken while former president Obama was in office. So those pictures are actually pictures that came out of his administration, not out of the Trump administration. And the media knows that, too. But they did not press for truth. They're pressing an agenda and counting on our passivity, our ignorance and our laziness to be able to buy to, to, to be able to sell us lies that they expect us to buy into lock, stock, and barrel. And here is the danger of it. Here's the sadness of it, that not only have we done it, but the church itself has done it. The church has brought into the lies and have pushed it because the church has dr has uh, is drunk in many cases off of the political juice that it's drank. And now we're wheeling under the, under the weight of that, 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 uh, liqueur that has impaired our judgment and slurred our speech and dimmed our vision. And we do that in the name of God. That's why I'm telling you that this whole piece of SABWB, by the way, I, I was with the office staff this morning and uh, uh, every Friday, every Friday, there's going to be a, a prayer uh, time uh, at, at 10 o'clock on Fridays. Uh, you can go to our SABWB page on Friday and join in from wherever you are uh, in on that prayer. If you're in your office, put it on your phone. Just let it play while you be productive and do your work and while you, you prove yourself to be the best employee that that person has. But you can hear it like you're listening to a radio. You can hear what prayers are being prayed, and, and there's, a, there's a makeup that you have that your spirit is alive under God. And while you're doing the widget thing with your hand and with your mind, your spirit can be in agreement with the prayers that's being prayed on Fridays at, uh, on the SABWB Facebook page. Uh, Natalie Hardy, our ex executive director, will be leading in that prayer effort. And you will see that there's efforts like that going on. Listen, folks, this is why SABWB needs your partnership now so that we can keep the pressure on every single day bringing truth. So uh, you just you just saw that piece uh, where President Obama lied just outright lied and, and lied very suavely, lied very eruditely. He knew that what he was saying was not true. And yet the media complicit with him allowed him to say it. And thank God for the daily caller. They got in touch with Sam Rodriguez and had him uh, respond to what he said, because what he said was essentially that Latinos don't care about the fact that he's spoken racial slurs about them and that he put the children in cages when he knows that both of those things are not true. And they care more about uh, him agreeing with their uh, their agenda on life and on marriage as if though their viewpoint thank god that that again uh pastor rodriguez spoke to that issue spoke up about it yes the hispanic community is uh, pro family and pro life and unapologetically so 
And contrary to the way blacks vote, I got news for you that so are African-Americans pro-family and pro-life for the most part. Well, then why is there so much of, of a percentage uh, of black babies that are murdered in the womb uh, come from such a small percentage of the population? About The numbers are about 6% of the population produces about 33% of the, the abortions in this country. If, if blacks are so pro-life, why are they doing that? Well, they're doing it largely because Margaret Sanger and... Uh, what was then called the American Birth Control League, partnered with churches and black leaders and got them to buy into their own genocide. And we have now, since those days, been embracing genocide to our own demise. We're we're the only demographic in the country that that is decreasing in number. And we're decreasing in number in part, not only due to jails and uh, our our people being locked up. That's another whole uh, issue. Uh, we've got work to do. We have got, and this issue must be worked every day. It's got to be faced every day. And your partnership with SABWB helps make that happen. Now, I want you to, I want to turn our attention to the, to the Biden Harris administration. And uh, President Biden is a Catholic by his own admission. And here is what a Catholic priest has to say about, President Biden's principles that is guiding him in the, and arguably the most powerful seat in the land. And I'll say this, I pity our president because I see the demise that he's going through. I see the emotional and the mental and the cognitive decline that he's in, but those who are using him don't care anything about him. They're trotting him in front of the camera, putting things on a a prompter for him to say, afraid to let him have a press conference. And while he's not the one leading the country, people, I mean, you know that. You know that these these things that are being written, uh, these executive orders, he's not writing those. He's not thinking through with a team of his people writing those executive orders. They're using uh, President Biden as a puppet. And my heart really goes out to him. I'm I'm broken, uh, saddened over the way that a political agenda will use an elderly. It's almost like elderly abuse. They will use him to their own end. And he's complicit in it. He's complicit in his use. It doesn't make any it doesn't make any less sad. Listen to what this priest has to say about the positions that Joe Biden has and that he's taken in this uh, in his presidency that are contrary to what the tenets of his faith is supposed to dictate. Watch this. And on top of that, we've just recently elected a Catholic president, and he is Catholic. He's baptized. He is a member of the family. We've just elected a Catholic president who is diametrically opposed to all of the basic moral principles that are proclaimed by the Roman Catholic Church. Not only abortion and the sanctity of human life, but the sanctity of marriage and this gender silliness. How in the world did that happen? A Catholic. I'll tell you, if he wasn't Catholic, I probably wouldn't be so upset. He's a member of my family. He's the most powerful man in the world. And he is absolutely opposed to the basic understanding is that God is the author of life. How in the world did this happen? You want an answer? I'll tell you the answer. Because our bishops have been silent for 60 years through bad catechesis and cowardice. They have barely said a thing. A few papers here and there. They speak. Of, there's things they could do. You say, well, why don't you do something? I'm just a little diocesan priest. I'm a grunt. They're the apostles. They have the voice. I just work for them at their privilege. They can get rid of me tomorrow. How have they allowed this to happen? What is it that they really believe? How poorly have they educated you? Now I'm telling you, it took that that parish priest some guts to say what he just said. Uh, Folks, listen to me. Uh, 
Yeah, I, 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 I get it, people. I get it. I see what I see your remarks. Uh, Rosemary, I agree. Uh, yes. Uh, this guy, guys, I really, I really, really need you to like and share this broadcast. I really need you to do that. Let's break the algorithms and get this voice of SABWB out to our city and out to what happens in our nation so that the, the rallying cry can go forth. And hundreds of thousands of people right here in our own city, hundreds of thousands of us have lived through the winter of our discontent and we're not taking it anymore. But but we have to answer rightly. We have to answer in a right spirit. We have to answer in a coordinated thought through way. We have to answer in a way that honors God and answer in a way that reveals God's character and nature and at the same time reveals God's power. You and I have some work to do, folks. I've got one more video that I want to show you. I, I fore, forewent the, uh, the commercials tonight. Uh, I've gone. I've been going with you an hour and ten minutes. So thanks for hanging hanging in here with me. But this priest just spoke about Biden's principles. Now I want you to hear the governor of Texas talk about Biden's policies. His principles, as a Catholic, are not being upheld in his office and and in his administration. Well, you say the whole world is not Catholic, and everybody in the United States is not Catholic. You're right about that. But the principles of life and the principles of liberty and the principles of family, those are much older than the United States itself is. Those are much older than that. You and I have the luxury to live in a nation that was founded on universal godly principles that have guided the human's existence on the planet for millennia. Now there have been deviants and very and and variants and and uh, departures from those principles in every time and in every culture, but that does not delegitimize the culture. What caused empires to fall, particularly the Roman Empire, was not the aggressive powers of enemies that came against them, but it was the corruption of it from within. And you and I are now seeing in our own empire, in our own nation, corruption coming from within that will, if left to its own, will destroy the nation and we will become a byword of history like so many other nations before us. But we are here. I'm telling you, not on our watch, not on SABWB's watch, will this go unanswered and unanswered in a strategic and powerful way. Now, I just felt, I just felt this in my spirit right now. There, there are some who is either watching me now or will be watching that this is the place where you should put that significant sum of money that you have been holding to give into the right cause. I told you uh, uh, not just weeks ago uh, that a, a gift uh, was given to us of a challenge gift. This, these, this couple said, we, uh, 1,500 partners is what you need a month. We're going to act like we're 40 partners this month. 1,500 partners a month at $10 a month, uh, that's 15000 a month. We're going to act like we're 40 of your partners. We're going to sow. Now, some of you can do a whole month of partners. You can do it tonight. And your, your gift undergirds your voice because SABWB is your voice. SAB, SABWB is your think tank. SABWB is your inroad into relationships that we already have established that is in the business community, that is in education, getting all of those pillars of influence on the same playing field and be able to strategize, to think with, with the mind of God. How can we bring these pillars of influence out of the clutches of these people who want to destroy us and destroy the nation and destroy our children and bring our culture back? San Antonio shall be saved. America shall be saved. It's your partnership that helps it happen. 
you can, if you want to write the, 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 the check, uh, you can do it tonight. Write it to OMI, Outpouring Missions International. Just OMI, write that check. I got a check today, a very sizable check to that same organization, OMI. And I need you, and I need you to continue to move this forward. I'm going to show this last piece to you because this is real time. This happened today. Our governor was on the coast, on the border of Texas today. And I want you to hear what he had to say about not only Biden's principles that the Catholic priest just talked about, but the effect of President Biden's policies. By the way, I'll tell you that, that the Democratic Party is getting ready to get rid of him. They're getting ready to get rid of him. They recognize his decline. He served his useful purpose. They're now about to turn him out to pasture and put in his place uh, Vice President Kamala Harris which is another whole issue. It won't go unaddressed, not at this level. And I pray that God raises up people. I just sent a letter uh, a Monday, yesterday, to Austin. I was asked to write a letter to a, a committee because the set in, we're in session in our own state now about the the government inserting itself into the rights of citizens and the rights of churches to remain open and viable and essential doing things like pandemics. We don't, we don't need the government's approval. The, the right to worship and the right to assemble didn't come from government. These are inalienable rights granted by our creator. And we have common sense enough to know, and we have uh, research enough to know and, and compassion enough to know when to, op, to, to do that in a safe and effective manner for the people that, that uh, see us as their shepherds and leaders. We got, we're not dumb. So, the, so the, the government does not have to do our job for us. They're not required, nor are they authorized or permitted to do our job for us. I wrote that letter yesterday to our own state government. You and I have to be people. Eric, thanks for coming on uh, today. And thank you for your opinion. Uh, I do know what I'm talking about, but that's okay. Uh, so, so I want you to listen to, I want you to listen to this last piece of, uh, last piece of uh, video. It is our governor at the border talking about the relevant current effects of the policies of the Biden-Harris administration. Here's Governor Abbott. Uh, also, the opportunity to get a briefing from the Texas Department of Public Safety uh, and the National Guard, as well as have the opportunity to fly over the region. As we were flying over the region, we did see people uh, crossing the border illegally uh, and making their way across the river uh, onto the Texas side of the border. Uh, we saw an ICE detention center uh, as well as uh, other holding facilities. Uh, and obviously, we are uh, at this location now. Uh, in my briefing, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, speak to leaders at national lo local levels. I, I do want to thank uh, people who are with us here today. Uh, they include the uh, director of the Texas Department of Public Safety, uh, Steve McCraw, uh, General Norris, uh, the uh, adjutant general in charge of the National Guard in the state of Texas, uh, as well as the national president uh, for the Border Patrol Council, uh, Brandon Judd. I thank them for being here, but also uh, especially for our state team members uh, for their, their, their leadership uh, in the Texas Operation Lone Star. Let me begin by making one point very clear. There is a crisis on the Texas border right now uh, with the overwhelming number of people who are coming across the border. This crisis is a result of President Biden's open border policies. It invites illegal immigration, and is creating a humanitarian crisis in Texas right now uh, that will grow increasingly worse by the day. In getting information in my meeting with the Border Patrol, I learned these things. And that is one of the reasons for this crisis that has led to a dramatic change in just a few months is the change in policy. There was a policy uh, that uh, people who had come across the border illegally would be returned across the border 
and there was also the remain in Mexico policy. Uh, with the elimination of those policies, that led to a dramatic increase in the number of people coming across the border. Uh, second, uh, the, the Border Patrol told me that they did inform the Biden administration and let them know that this influx was coming. So it's not as if the Biden administration didn't know about it, and it's not as if they didn't have time to get prepared for it, but it is clear they are completely unprepared for what is going on the border now, and they're gonna be even more unprepared for what will be happening in the coming months. What the Border Patrol told me, and this is actually part of the cartel strategy, because of the volume of people coming across the border, the Border Patrol that makes uh, the, the arrest they have to engage quite literally in babysitting. And while they're doing babysitting, that provides an opportunity for the cartels to be able to bring other people across the border illegally. More about the cartels in a second. Two factoids that the Border Patrol shared with me. Just this calendar year alone, there have been more than 800 criminal aliens apprehended. Those were criminals, uh, violent criminals, who had been previously arrested in the United States and deported, who came across the border again. Among those included 78 sex offenders and 62 gang members, including gang, gang members from MS-13. And know this, cartels, they are ramping up trafficking across the border. They're exploiting women and children and they are overwhelming Border Patrol resources. The Border Patrol has made very clear to me the way this strategy works. The cartels, they are involved in every single one of these border crossings that we see. But more important, the cartels are even more involved in the crossings that we do not see. The strategy of the cartels is to overwhelm Border Patrol agents and law enforcement officials. And when the Border Patrol agents are so completely overwhelmed, it's during those moments that the cartels will bring across the border even the more dangerous elements. It could be uh, people who are violent criminals, or it could be people who are from what are called uh, special interest countries. Those are interests, uh, those are countries that are uh, uh, raised concerns uh, about the danger they may pose to the United States, such as people coming from countries like Iran and Iraq, China, as well as elsewhere. Uh, faded. All right, that, that should be shocking to you. It should be absolutely shocking to you that that, now that wasn't from months ago. That was from today, people. And you heard Governor Abbott say that the Border Patrol has told him that in this calendar year alone, and this is the 9th of March, only two months and eight days, that these, these policies have resulted in 800 people that were arrested and deported, criminals. They have reinserted themselves back into the United States, and some of those criminal elements include 78 sex offenders, and 60-some-odd violent criminals, including members from MS-13. That's what this administration's policy is doing, not only to border states like Texas, Mexico, Arizona, California, New Mexico, Arizona, California, but all across, all across the nation, because they're not just staying here. In fact, San Antonio is a, major, is a major transfer hub for human trafficking. If you were in the meeting yesterday, you would have heard uh, Cindy, who's running for District 1 council person, and she'd make a great council person in that district. You would hear her say that in the, in the business of her campaigning, that she actually ran into children that were being trafficked in District 1 because San Antonio is a major hub, 35 runs completely north and south, I-10 runs completely east and west, so get to San Antonio, you have routes, major thoroughfares to either side of the United States, north and south, east and west. And those policies that the Biden-Harris administration are putting forth is damaging the welfare of your family and mine. 
they will continue to do so because they don't care about you. They care about their agenda. The act, when, when I joined the military in uh, August of 1979, I took an oath, uh, and that oath said that I would protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, all, 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 all enemies, foreign and domestic. Now, we have foreign enemies. The, the, the Islamic nations in the 1040 window have been shouting for decades, death to America, death to America. We do have far, foreign enemies in, uh, in the nation of Russia. We have foreign, foreign enemies in North Korea. We have foreign enemies in other hostile, action, hostile places of the world. But we all also have domestic enemies. Domestic enemies are our new segregationalists. These are those who are who are saying on the face one thing, but doing the exact opposite in their policies, like this Biden-Harris administration. And like our local San Antonio uh, governing authorities, our mayor and many of the city council. I live in District 7. Anna Sandoval is my council person. Uh, it was Danny Diaz who informed the room yesterday that in, an, uh, that in a desire of, of uh, Councilman Sandoval expressing not to have a, a, a police force that is so militarized that they actually uh, were forced by city council to give up some equipment that actually saved some, that, that actually were in place to save lives of police officers, robots that they could send inside of a, a building and not endanger themselves, robots that have cameras on them. They could look around and see and know exactly what to do and how to target because that was a military piece of equipment. Uh, the, the San Antonio Police Department had to give it up at the request of city council, give it back $2 million worth of stuff. And now uh, Sandoval and crew have found out that they made an error and now they want to go purchase the same equipment that they got for nothing. They now want to spend millions of dollars to purchase it again. There is no reason to keep people like that in office. When, when those kinds of decisions are made consistently, they're not the wishes of the safety and the network and the, the welfare of the citizens of San Antonio. These are outside forces, domestic but hostile forces to the liberties that you and I have been granted as inalienable rights from Almighty God. Now, I need you people. I'm closing out with you. I've, I've been on here a long time with you. I think my producer told me some minutes ago that I've been on here like an hour and 10 minutes already. But I need you to like and share this broadcast tonight. And I need you as partners. Text to 84321, the number 10, space S-A-B-W-B, and be prepared to do that for the next 12 months. Be prepared to do that for the next 12 months. Some of, you, some of you will do like my friend Jack did yesterday in the meeting. Uh, he says, I'm going to go ahead and bite the bullet. Pastor Flowers, I'm going to bite the bullet. And he paid his, his entire uh, year's membership yesterday. 100 uh, partnership, I should say. Uh, $120. Thank you, Jack, for doing that. And maybe some of the rest of you who you have been listening and waiting. I, I, I felt this thing a minute ago when I spoke to some of you, because there's some of you who have, you got, you got resources God has blessed you with, multiplied resources, and you've been looking for a place to put it that would do the city some good. SABWB is that place. Text that amount to 84321. The amount you want to give, I'm recommending 10 because that means that you'll become our partner and we will contact you to make sure that that's a monthly thing you want to do. But if you want to give a one time huge gift of 15,000 or 20 or 30 thousand dollars, go ahead and do that because it arms us with the ability to stay on task 24 seven pushing the things like this that need to be pushed and get information and action steps to you that need to take place in order to turn our culture, to bring, uh, uh, to shape our culture back in the direction of the things of God. All right. You've, you've been very patient. You've hung in there with me tonight. You've seen a lot. Uh, pass this around. Share it, share it, share it, share it. Listen, it only takes just a, a click of a button for you to share this broadcast 
with someone who you know needs to hear the other side of the issue. And who knows, in your sharing, it may hit that, that person that will say, I'll just go ahead and write, that, write it off for the year. I'll, write, I'll underwrite this for a year. Let's see what God will do with SABWB for a year. If God's speaking to your heart about it, do that. A week, a month, a year, go ahead. Our monthly budget's 15000 Somebody say, I can take the whole month. Our annual budget is 180000 Somebody say, I can take the whole year. You have the resources. God's given you the resources. Go ahead and do it. If that's not you, do 10 a month. Because 1,500 of us doing 10 a month will meet the same budget end. Thank you for being our partners. We're going to stay on the fighting field. We're going to stay in the face of people every day of the week to make sure that our culture is shaped toward God. Because SABWB is the place for influencers from every race, position, and perspective who come together for two main purposes, to build trusting relationships and collaborate both on the value and the implementation of principles that shape the culture. Thank you for being with me. I'll see you next Tuesday. Bye-bye now.